Good afternoon and good evening. My name is John Herbst. I run the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. And we've got another wonderful event for you today on Nord Stream 2. Uh, we are convening today um, at actually a very critical point. It's not just a question of the status of Nord Stream 2, and we will get into that in great depth. We're also convening as Moscow has for second time this year, massed forces on the border, its border with Ukraine. And Mr. Putin and others in senior leadership in Russia have been speaking in warlike fashion about Ukraine. Uh, the decision on Nord Stream 2, I think, plays into this. And we need to keep this in mind as we conduct this discussion. And I'll try to do that. So we have a wonderful set of speakers for you today. We have Viola von Cremont Tabadell, a member of the European Parliament with the Group of the Greens and the European Free Alliance, who is also the vice chair of the delegation to the EU Ukraine Parliamentary Association. We have Yuri Vitrenko, the chief executive author of NAFTA Haas. We have Rudin Groza, the executive director at the Institute for European Policies and Reforms in Moldova. We have Zygimantis Pavilionis, member of the Lithuanian Simos with the Homeland Union Lithuanian Christian Democrats. And we have Dr. Benjamin Schmidt, senior fellow with the Democratic Resilience Program at the Center for European Policy Analysis and the postdoctoral research fellow and project development scientist at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. So with that, we'll turn right to the conversation. Um, I'll start with uh, Mr. Vitrenko. Yuri, when the Biden administration waived sanctions in May, Senator, Secretary Blinken said that if Moscow starts to use gas for political purposes, sanctions can always be reimposed. What has happened in the gas market in Europe since then? And what has Moscow done as gas supplies have tightened? Well, uh, what we can see at the moment uh, is that uh, Putin and, and Russia in general um, is using gas as a geopolitical weapon to the full extent. Uh, so we see uh, some record uh, high prices uh, because uh, um, Russia decreased uh, their supplies uh, of gas uh, to Europe, uh, despite some increased demand, uh, despite, again, uh, very high prices. Unlike, for example, Norwegians who increased uh, supplies uh, to Europe, Russia decreased uh, supply, uh, supplies to Europe, um, causing, again, uh, the problems in the market. Uh, then uh, we saw uh, the use of gas uh, as a weapon against Moldova. Um, it seems like uh, uh, the crisis in Moldova uh, uh, has been put on hold, uh, but it's far from being resolved. Uh, then uh, we also saw some really very obvious blackmail uh, of uh, Europe by Putin against when he said that uh, if you want to have more gas, you have to allow uh, Nord Stream 2 to become operational even without the compliance with European law. And uh, you have to go back to um, long term contracts. Basically, meaning that uh, Europe should uh, uh, forget about their uh, energy transition and the climate change uh, plans and uh, to go back to old uh, good times, good for Putin, when uh, um, Europe uh, made commitments to import huge volumes of gas from Russia uh, for a long uh, period of time. Um, then... Um, we also now see some very clear um, legal uh, tricks uh, or actually illegal tricks uh, by Gazprom when uh, they uh, want to certify not the entire pipeline, not Nord Stream 2 pipeline as a whole, um, as it was clearly uh, envisaged by the lawmakers in Brussels when the European Parliament made the decision to apply the third energy package to Nord Stream 2. Uh, it, it's clear, basically, that they, they meant the entire pipe. They did not mean just the last mile that goes on the German territory. Because uh, should they mean the last uh, mile, they did not need to change anything. Like, for example, in case of APAL, that is an extension of uh, Nord Stream 1. So APAL is a pipeline on the German territory. It's, it was under the third energy package even before. So when the European Parliament made this decision to apply the third energy package to Nord Stream 2, it was clear that they meant the whole pipe. But instead of playing by the rule, uh, what Gazprom is trying to do is just basically uh, to uh, flagrantly violate these rules 
by trying to certify it only the last pipe, uh, last mile. So to round it up, um, what we see that uh, Putin is trying to show into the face of the US administration and Germany that they are above the uh, law uh, and uh, that uh, it's their, uh, how you say it, uh, unalienable right, basically, uh, to use uh, the gas as a geopolitical uh, weapon. It's a natural right. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Zikimantis, Lithuania has done a great deal to guarantee its own energy security. In your judgment, what impact has Nord Stream 2's waiver had on European energy security? Also, do you think it gives Moscow more freedom to back Lukashenko as he provokes a crisis on the Belarus border with Poland? and for that matter, Lithuania. Thank you so much. Well, maybe drawing from uh, Lithuanian experience, uh, uh, what we understood from the first years of our accession to EU and NATO, you have to get rid of all possible dependencies on autocratic states, uh, including Russia. Well, today also China, but that's uh, another story. Uh, so once we've been like uh, Moldovans or Ukrainians, we sold our gas network to Russians uh, with a big promise to have a cheap gas. And we ended with paying the highest prices of gas in Europe. I remember it was 850 or something. That was incredible. So instead, uh, we unbundled completely our market. We were using uh, those EU legislation and we built uh, LNG terminal. Now we are free, market prices, and we forget uh, Gazprom. The same with oil. I remember Dick Cheney landed in Vilnius in 2006 and said, Putin, I will not allow you to use energy weapons to destroy democracy. Well, when he said it, Putin was so much afraid that he started to fix oil supply a pipeline called Druzhba to Lithuania, and he's fixing it till today. So alternative, we build oil terminal on the sea and we receive oil from anywhere. Uh, so uh, learning from those conclusions, uh, besides, of course, building all possible networks to Nordic uh, countries and Poland, uh, our lesson is just one. I was preaching it in Moldova and I say the same to Ukrainians. Get rid of those links as soon as you can. Integrate uh, your system into European Union as soon as you can. And then little appeal to Berlin and Washington. Uh, you know, I really expect that maybe green foreign minister soon in coalition in Berlin will do something that Joschka Fischer did to us. I still remember that green foreign minister who called himself advocate of the Baltic states. And maybe, you know, it will be Germany that will be advocate of Ukraine, and Moldova and Belarus at will, and will not allow to conclude deals like Nord Stream 2, because interestingly that Nord Stream 1 was concluded one year after Orange Revolution. Putin invented this uh, instrument to divide and actually paralyze the world. And maybe not so surprising that in 2008, Merkel, and French leader blocked uh, EU uh, NATO expansion to Ukraine. EU expansion is also blocked. Uh, so for me, it was not no big surprise that Merkel took a telephone uh, and called Lukashenko. Uh, and it kind of surprisingly also coincides with uh, uh, Nord Stream 2 launch. So conclusion is clear, get rid of those deals that paralyze your political will and be Yoshka's fishers of today. Please open uh, the hearts and doors for EU and NATO enlargement to, uh, to those countries. I, I mean to my friends in Berlin. And also the same I said to Biden. If you want to be the Reagan uh, of today, what Reagan did for Central Europeans and Balkans, fight for in NATO and EU enlargement and fight for democracy in Belarus. Don't allow Lukashenko and Putin to divide us and rule. Okay, thank you very much for that. Okay, Mr. Groza, newspaper reports indicate that Moscow in negotiating a new deal, gas deal with Chisinau sought to include political issues. UAE EU chief diplomat Joseph Burrell called out Moscow for using gas for political leverage. What was Moscow trying to do? Well, obviously, uh, 
uh, Moscow is trying to use the gas crisis uh, to uh, create uh, uh, more pressure uh, on providing some political conditionalities to the process. Um, however, uh, what it is clear is that uh, today Moldova uh, managed at least at this stage to go uh, through this uh, process, through this crisis. And that is pretty much thanks to the uh, leverage that uh, Moldovan government could create with the support uh, of all partners with the, part, with the European Union and Ukraine. Um, it's obviously that uh, another um, uh, target that uh, Kremlin wanted was uh, to uh, try to engage into, or at least to have a voice in uh, Moldova's trade with the European Union. Um, but more, pra more pragmatic, probably, uh, uh, um, uh, objective of uh, this uh, gas uh, crisis we had uh, with Russia to deal with uh, was basically uh, postponing the unbundling uh, of the uh, gas uh, sector in, uh, in Moldova. Moldova is committed uh, uh, to uh, unbundle uh, the uh, gas uh, system uh, already uh, until the end of, uh, or actually beginning of 2020. So there is a quite a large delay in transposing uh, that commitment um, by Moldova Gas, which is, yeah, Moldova Gas is pretty much a, uh, a company where Gazprom has the majority of the shares. Uh, and they have a say in the transposition of the unbundling properly uh, in the country. So uh, at the same time, of course, uh, Moldova Gas was subject to sanctions because of not committing the uh, unbundling commitment. And... Uh, Surprisingly, uh, this topic uh, topped up in the uh, discussions. And at the end, well, we have a deal, uh, at least a transitional deal uh, with uh, uh, Gazprom, which was agreed uh, by the government, which uh, probably buys some time for us, uh, for Moldova, uh, to get ready to uh, prepare uh, for and to increase our uh, energy independence and energy security by increasing and finding opportunities of gas storage in Ukraine and uh, Romania. Uh, for this type of crisis. Uh, but more importantly, um, the good news, and actually what helped us a bit to increase the bargaining uh, uh, as the country uh, in the talks with Gazprom was the fact that uh, as of uh, October, Moldova has already an alternative uh, gas pipeline interconnect uh, that connects uh, us with Romania, with the European Union. Um, and it also provides a uh, um, potential for supply of uh, gas uh, in crisis situations. Um, at the same time, the crisis of transit of gas in 2019 of Gazprom with uh, NAFTA gas uh, with Ukraine um, helped uh, in a way or another way to uh, uh, prepare uh, uh, Moldova also for the reverse flows uh, on the uh, Transbalkanic trans pipeline. Uh, uh, and uh, in, in that sense, now today, Moldova has more alternatives of supply of gas. But of course, the key question is uh, um, uh, the proper gas, which uh, doesn't differ in terms of uh, what we see now. Of course, Europe and we are still very much dependent on the uh, gas from uh, Gazprom. And for us, it, it's really important to look for opportunities also how to ensure our energy security of the short term, but also to increase our energy efficiency and reduce consumption of gas. Uh, and imp implement uh, uh, alternative uh, um, re renewables um, uh, for that. So uh, to conclude here, um, yes, indeed, uh, probably Kremlin wanted uh, to use this gas crisis in Europe um, because uh, uh, it was attempted at the beginning uh, to use political conditionalities. Uh, the position of the government and the strategy of the government was to separate uh, any political talks from commercial talks between Moldova Gas and Gazprom. And at the end of the day, well, uh, we got the uh, contract which was uh, prolonged. Uh, yes, there are some safeguards that have to be uh, uh, delivered, and one of them is the auditing of the depths of Moldova gas uh, towards Gazprom, which will be done uh, by the government. And based on that, uh, um, the uh, suspension of the unbundling should be decided. Anyways, if um, uh, that is not enough, then we will see uh, more talks now between Kishinev and Moscow on a more comprehensive energy uh, agreement uh, that has to deal also with uh, a larger parts of the depths uh, that Moldova gas has to gas from, which is uh, uh, those from the Transnistrian region, uh, which do not pay uh, this uh, gas. Okay. Thank you very much for that comprehensive answer.
Okay, Ms. Ron Cremon Tabadell. In July, the US and Germany signed a joint declaration saying that they would take note of and respond if Moscow used Nord Stream 2 for political purposes. But Chancellor Merkel said that Moscow bears no responsible for current gas problems in Europe. Has Merkel or any other senior German official joined Burrell in criticizing Moscow? Does Germany feel the joint statement with the US actually requires it to take strong action against Kremlin exploitation of Nord Stream 2 for political purposes? What will the Nord Stream 2 policy of the new German government be? Well, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Herbst. Uh, let me start maybe with a little bit um, of the history. Uh, you know that uh, the transatlantic relation between Germany and the US were not in the best, uh, let's say, constitution or shape uh, when President Biden took over. So the new administration was extremely keen to find ways how to improve uh, those relations. And I know from some inside conversations and meeting with colleagues uh, on the other side um, of the Atlantic that they really look very carefully what kind of projects they could use to improve without, uh, let's say, um, uh, creating even more uh, problems in the European Union. And I think it was in the end the decision to get Germany stronger on the side of the US for, uh, let's say, the fight against the Chinese um, supremacy, <laughs> let's put it that way, uh, then taking uh, the risk, the danger, uh, the, <coughs> uh, the, the geopolitical threat uh, too seriously. I would say that uh, we have seen a lot of damage coming from the Trump administration, but if there was one project where we actually stayed in line with the Trump administration, it was surely the sanctions uh, on Nord Stream 2. Maybe not on this individual poor mayor on Rügen, okay, that was rather uh, stupidity, but otherwise, in general, uh, that could have postponed the entire uh, construction and the finishing of the pipeline and could have saved a lot of time. And that President Biden in the end decided um, <clears throat> to dismiss those sanctions, um, I think there was a strategic mistake. It was a strategic mistake because it's actually said that's green light uh, for Gazprom to finish that and then go for whatever they want. And of course, it is a huge threat and there's no question about that. Uh, Mr. Vitrenko has mentioned that, uh, Gigis has mentioned that, that uh, Russia is now free to use gas even more as a geopolitical weapon uh, as they have, uh, as they could have done in, in the past. Uh, the um, example of, uh, of Mulder uh, was just extensively explained. So I think from the very beginning, it was a strategic mistake from the US. Uh, it is extremely unfortunate that in the outgoing government, we have no one um, objecting uh, the pipeline and Nord Stream 2. Um, while I fully share uh, Jiggy's assessment that Nord Stream 1 was built after the Orange Revolution and Nord Stream 2 was built after the uh, annexation of Crimea. I mean, more than obvious uh, is impossible. So that was a, a real, uh, let's say, signal to the European Union. I see in the European Union um, and in the Commission, but also especially here in the Parliament, a big resistance. And I really hope uh, that we can manage uh, from the European side, side together with the new uh, government in Germany um, to get some more, let's say, legal objections and to find and ways how to postpone the entire process so that at least uh, we can increase uh, the cost uh, for the entire unbundling process and to, uh, to make sure that we have, uh, let's say, a, um, 
all uh, provisions in place which are set up by the gas uh, directive. Then this was clear from the very beginning. Uh, Gazprom has hoped they can pass around. Uh, they can uh, sue each and everyone to get this exemption from the gas directive. That has not worked. Now they put political pressure on uh, different national uh, governments. They put political pressure on the uh, German regulator. They put political pressure on everyone else. So far, it has not worked, and this is a, a good signal. But on a political level, you're absolutely right, and I share your criticism fully since we Greens have been against uh, this project from the very beginning. <clears throat> there was nobody in the... Uh, let's say, senior ranks of either the SPD or the CDU uh, who criticized that, who criticized this weaponizing uh, of, uh, of gas prices, uh, playing uh, with the dependency of the European Union, of Germany, of individual states. And I think that Germany bears a lot of responsibility for the situation as it is and for the increasing influence, the increasing power Gazprom will see when in case, in case uh, Nord Stream uh, 2 will be in place. We see how they play now with Ukraine, with uh, disconnecting coal, gas and all the other fossils uh, uh, to Ukraine. Uh, and, and, and so it is a never <laughs> ending story. And of course, um, we have to see how much persistence uh, we we see in uh, in different institutions. As I said, so far all this blackmailing, all this pressure has not worked, and I do hope uh, that uh, we stay uh, persistent and uh, stem as we have done before. All right. Thank you very much for that full answer. All right, uh, Mr. Schmidt. While the U.S. helped Moldova find a solution to the gas supply problem created by Moscow, as far as I know, no senior U.S. official has publicly criticized Moscow for bullying Moldova in gas talks. Is that right? Congress is unhappy with the administration's decision to waive sanctions and the reluctance of the administration to live up to its pledges and reassess the decision now that Moscow was in fact using gas for political ends. Can Congress in fact stop the use of Nord Stream 2 at this late date? Thanks, Ambassador Herbst, and uh, thanks to all the panelists for your great comments so far. I'll, I'll start by saying, yes, absolutely, Congress uh, has a role, um, and I, I think based on its track record over the past three years plus, uh, from CATSA through um, the, the, the previous two National Defense Authorization Acts, they have shown an ability to act and be effective and in, in, in stop this project at various stages uh, of its development. Uh, but let's let's step back and look at the um, the geopolitical framework in which we're operating right now. We've heard various examples of Russia's weaponization weaponization of energy. Back in July, uh, the Biden administration came out with a joint declaration, joint statement. wasn't a deal, but a joint statement uh, between um, uh, Washington, Berlin, that said that if quote unquote if the uh, uh, if if it was seen that Russia is using energy as a weapon, then Germany would act at the national level to press for sanctions at the EU level uh, uh, against uh, projects like Nord Stream 2 and other uh, Russian energy export projects. Uh, we have not seen that, uh, uh, seen Berlin uh, uh, come through on its side of, of this agreement. And, and therefore, I think that's why we're seeing Putin feel like he can act with more impunity uh, in the energy space over the past several months, we've seen Putin explicitly link um, uh, a quick regulatory approval of Nord Stream 2 with, uh, with, with an increase in Russian gas supply volumes uh, to European storages ahead of uh, what will be, by any accounts, a cold winter in Europe, um, which is, if not uh, the, the archetype of using energy uh, as a political weapon, I don't know what is. That happened in October. Um, we have seen, obviously, the weaponization of energy, Gazprom's uh, pressing back on um, Moldova's uh, Euro-Atlantic aspirations in Chisinau. Um, that's, that's very obviously using energy as a political weapon. We've seen uh, um, Russia's client state, uh, Belarus, uh, in particular, President Lukashenko, uh, explicitly uh, threatened the EU with gas cutoffs of the Amal pipeline uh, should the EU... Uh, move to sanction the Lukashenko regime for its various uh, misdeeds over the past several months, um, and, and, and so on and so forth. But as we look at this, we also see 
the broader national security framework that 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 we're operating in, in in the transatlantic space right now, which is to say, Russia's what I'm calling the weaponization of of everything. Okay, so we obviously have this weaponization of energy going on. We have uh, a weaponization of of military uh, threat going on with the uh, increase in Russian deployments of uh, of military personnel and equipment on the Russian Ukrainian border. Uh, we have uh, Putin's client state of Belarus weaponizing migration on the Lithuanian uh, and Polish borders. And just last week, we saw Russia take another step to weaponize uh, an area that is often overlooked, which is space in, in the shoot down of a um, of a defunct Russian satellite that actually created a large space debris field and put the International Space Station, including Roscosmos own cosmonauts at risk. This is an increasingly provocative stance. And this is exactly why things like sanctions on Nord Stream 2 need to be taken or other actions uh, that the administration has to take along with Germany to acknowledge at minimum that Russia is using energy as a political weapon right now, right here and now. So uh, we've seen uh, Congress debate over the past several months a potential third round of sanctions. We had two years of NDAA sanctions. This would be a third that basically would target Nord Stream 2 AG, uh, which although physically located in Zug, Switzerland is a 100% owned uh, company that is owned by, uh, by Kremlin controlled Gazprom. Uh, so it's, it's a de facto Russian uh, entity that is physically located in Zug, Switzerland. Um, and that, that's important to, uh, to, 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 to note that distinction. Um, and, and so we've seen this, we've seen the House on a broadly bipartisan basis led by Democrat uh, uh, Democrat uh, uh, Representative Kaptur uh, move forward legislation uh, in the National Defense Authorization Act just a few months ago. And now we're seeing the Senate debate this same uh, language right now. There is currently, uh, is, uh, per, per media reports, a, a language basically that is identical to the bipartisan House legislation. And then on Friday, uh, um, Senator, uh, Menendez came out with legislation that said uh, basically a larger Russia sanctions package that said if Russia uh, invades Ukraine further, obviously there's already a war going on that Russia is uh, is behind in, in Ukraine and obviously illegally annexed uh, Crimea uh, several years ago. Uh, but if, quote unquote, Russia invades Ukraine further, then there will be sanctions and on that list is Nord Stream 2. The problem with that is that if you wait to sanction until there is Russian military aggression, the horse is already out of the barn in terms of deterrence, okay? Because right now, Russia relies on gas infrastructure in Ukraine to get its supplies to Europe without Nord Stream 2 currently being online. Should Nord Stream 2 actually become operational, you would have a situation in which Russia could reduce or, or, or end gas transit through Ukraine, including through infrastructure that is physically adjacent to, or in some cases circumscribing the line of contact in Donbass, allowing for an, an increase in aggression. So you really need to stop Nord Stream 2 as a deterrent for further Russian aggression, rather than as punishment, because at that point, uh, there really is, is nothing you can do. And, and, um, and I think that's why this is as urgent as ever. And, and I think we're going to obviously see in the next couple of weeks as we come out of the uh, Thanksgiving recess in the United States, uh, the Senate and the House uh, increasingly be concerned about this uh, and, and be discussing these sanctions packages, which we can, of course, continue to discuss today. Okay, thank you, Dr. Schmidt. Uh, Mr. Vitranko, um, Ben raises a point which I think is worth exploring. Um, you have Nord Stream 2 decision, the waiver decision in May, the joint statement with the Germans in July, Russian gas games, which would produce no real response from Berlin or Washington, for months and months and months. And now you have the second Russian buildup on Ukraine's border. And as Ben mentioned, the uh, presence of gas line pipes where Russian gas was going to Europe and Ukraine was at least a partial uh, limit on Russian aggression in Ukraine. They wanted to, leave, wanted to make sure those pipelines were not, were not hurt. Now the pipelines may not be so necessary because of Nord Stream 2. So my question for you is this. Uh, what is the impact on Ukraine's military security of the Nord Stream 2 decision? Um, as it was uh, mentioned, uh, and I, by the way, I fully agree with uh, Mr. Schmidt, is that uh, um, it basically sometimes the, uh, I try to be diplomatic here because the US is our important uh, uh, strategic partner. 
but sometimes it's difficult to understand the logic uh, of the administration. So um, it's clear that uh, uh, if there is no gas flowing through Ukraine, uh, it's easier uh, for Russia to launch a full-scale military operation against uh, Ukraine because uh, uh, Russian flows won't be affected, so they will continue getting money uh, from the European market. And also, they will understand that uh, Europeans won't feel an immediate effect of such a war because uh, supplies of uh, gas to their homes uh, uh, won't be interrupted. Um, and uh, this kind of logical construct that uh, uh, now, for example, we hear from, uh, for example, Mr. Menendez, the Senator Menendez, is that, uh, look, uh, we'll have um, a condition that if uh, there is a full-scale war or, or if uh, this military aggression intensifies, then basically there will be sanctions. It seems like an invitation to an extent for this kind of military aggression. Uh, because first of all, I personally don't believe that uh, it will be easy uh, when there is a military aggression and uh, when it's clear that the gas cannot flow through Ukraine uh, to tell uh, Europeans that, look guys, you won't be, you will also uh, have to stay without Russian gas because uh, US will sanction Nord Stream 2. So if now, for example, the US sanctions Nord Stream 2, Europeans won't feel it, but if uh, U.S. sanctions Nord Stream 2 when it's operating, uh, Europeans may feel it if there are no flows uh, through Ukraine. Second, uh, uh, it basically means uh, that uh, Russians will now uh, play, uh, or can play at least, uh, a game when they say, okay, so we will invade Ukraine. And then uh, for if you want us to have some peace negotiations with Ukraine, then as a condition, uh, we will say, uh, okay, but uh, you should not impose sanctions on Nord Stream 2 and you should give us something more. So basically, there is a kind of an open invitation for Russians to increase stakes, uh, you see, uh, in, in this uh, military uh, aggression. And that's why, of course, uh, uh, for Ukraine, um, it, it makes us really uh, not comfortable uh, when uh, we see this uh, uh, open invitations for Russia to be more aggressive, again, to uh, be in breach with uh, this European rules. And um, again, coming back to this kind of logical construct of uh, Senator Menendez, to us, it seems really illogical. Um, so to reiterate the point, uh, we believe that uh, some sanctions should be imposed now. And then one can say that if Russia plays uh, by the rules, if Russia de uh, gas supplies, if Russia starts treating gas as uh, just a normal commodity, uh, it's not using it for political advantages, uh, for military advantages, for all this kind of stuff, then the US can reconsider their decision and to remove sanctions. But again, it's logical for us to uh, impose sanctions now to prevent uh, um, the aggression, to prevent uh, um, Russia from uh, ignoring basically European rules, to push Russia into the right direction, and especially if somebody hopes that it, it can be the case, and then to remove sanctions if they change their behavior, because it's clear that they are misbehaving in this situation. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Mr. Groza, what lesson should learn should the EU and the US draw from Moscow's negotiations with Moldova? How important is this is the EU's third energy package? And should Gazprom and Nord Stream 2 be subject to it? And what is necessary to help ensure Moldova's energy security? Well, first, uh, I will address the second question, which is uh, uh, how um, important is the uh, third energy package? I think the, 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 the first and the, the, the biggest lesson that uh, uh, this uh, gas uh, talks uh, uh, we had with uh, uh, Moscow is that the third energy package should be fully implemented and coherently implemented. Because exactly the fact that uh, we hadn't implemented the third energy package uh, created, exposed actually Moldova to vulnerabilities in the, these talks uh, with Russia. Uh, 
so first lesson, of course, is to fully and coherently implement the third energy package in the EU, in Moldova, and other countries who committed to, to transpose this, uh, to implement uh, these uh, gas rules. Um, and of course, uh, Gazprom and, and Nord Stream 2 should be subject uh, to third energy package, and no, no exceptions should be there, because, I mean, in principle, the third energy package was built to increase the uh, energy security, energy dependence uh, of the EU. Uh, so implementation of it, of course, uh, it means that uh, all, all uh, uh, the rules have to be fully uh, transposed and implemented. Um, another lesson that we learned, uh, uh, and I think that is important, is solidarity in action. Uh, which increases uh, the uh, bargaining leverage uh, of the side. Uh, uh, both the EU and uh, Moldova still, as I mentioned, uh, very much dependent on the uh, gas uh, supplies from uh, Russia. Uh, of course, EU to a lesser extent, Moldova to a much higher extent. Um, so what uh, should we do uh, next? Of course, it's to uh, increase energy efficiency, to reduce natural gas consumption, to implement alternatives, uh, um, uh, uh, renewables. Uh, um, and uh, Moldova should indeed uh, look for um, this uh, strategic infrastructure investment. And now, uh, of course, Moldova is on the way to uh, integrate with NSOE and NSOG. Um, currently, the uh, electricity transport system is, uh, is, is, is being upgraded, updated to make sure that Moldova can connect better to, to you and um, get supplies of electricity, not only from Ukraine, but also from Moldova. Um, and uh, that is provides a lot of opportunities also for investment for US, for EU investors here in Moldova, as we have a a pro-reform government that is committed to provide um, uh, a better environment for the businesses, uh, justice and rule of law, I think that provides a lot of opportunities. And Moldova needs uh, not only development support, but also infrastructure investment uh, to secure our energy uh, and independence uh, and, 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 and efficiency. One more thing, of course, to mention uh, is uh, the importance of uh, um, the uh, solidarity that uh, Moldova has seen into this uh, uh, gas talks and gas uh, uh, cooperation. And we have seen how important was that uh, in talks with Ukraine and Romania and increasing uh, energy cooperation, energy security cooperation um, between Moldova and Romania and, and, and Ukraine uh, further would provide better opportunities uh, for uh, Moldova, of course, in the future to um, uh, be in a more or in a better bargaining position uh, uh, with, uh, with Russia, because Russia will continue to be for years, probably uh, still uh, a very important supplier of natural gas. So it's up to all of us to think how to reduce gas consumption, how to increase energy uh, uh, efficiency and how to implement uh, the rules of the third energy package across Europe. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Zygimantos, do you have any indication or expectation that the Biden administration and Berlin will take steps to stop Moscow from punishing Ukraine and pressuring other European countries with gas leverage? If they do not act, what can the EU do? Well, I would say, you know, there is, there is no EU leadership without German leadership. Uh, and uh, I would really love to see Germany to lead uh, on those questions. This is exactly what is, you know, what, what we are waiting in Europe for, well, at least from Bucharest NATO summit from 2008, because this is exactly the date where democracies started to lose. You know, look to Freedom House reports, look to what's happening uh, um, yeah, at the globe. We are just 13% of population that's still breathe free and our area is shrinking, including in, in, this, uh, yeah, in this region. So I would love to see new coalition of Germany, maybe in the first decade of December, exactly more or less coinciding with Democracy Summit in Washington to surprise the world and say, no more Nord Streams, no more, you know, cash machines or dividing projects that 
Putin is cutting and paralyzing our will from within of EU. Remember that it, it was actually Germany that led this democracy building uh, with party foundations in Spain and Portugal only afterwards Reagan established its NDIs and IRIs and NETs and so on. So surprise the world, Germans, you know, lead it uh, with right decisions. But it's not only paralyzing Nord Stream 2. And of course, if they don't do it, I, I hope the Congress will do it finally, but also to build strategically Eastern and Southern neighborhood. Don't wait for next war or another Russian attack. Build it strategically. Look to this wonderful little country, Moldova, that elected first time in the world, the whole pyramid of pro-Western actors. They are waiting for EU perspective, waiting for a light at the end of the tunnel. And I noticed that Green Party wrote it in its pre-electoral program that, you know, EU enlargement, why not? Maybe NATO will follow later. But, you know, brief, kind of lead it, show the sign of the hope to Ukrainians, uh, uh, Moldovans, uh, who really try to do what they can. Uh, and, and finally, come to NATO. Uh, this is, of course, big Biden's lead. Uh, but I really hope that, you know, one year of Biden administration in democracy area will not be commemorated as a very bad strategic decision on Nord Stream 2. I really hope that by the end of this administration in Washington, I can really call Biden as Reagan for Ukraine, Moldova, Belarus, maybe Georgia, you know, do something historic, but it means think strategically. Don't always react to what Putin does, but act strategically. Kill Nord Stream 2, enlarge EU, enlarge NATO, and don't allow Lukashenko to survive another year. Okay. Thank you. Very strong statement. All right. I'm Ms. Von Carmon Tabadell. I'm Germany's network regulator, and pardon my pronunciation, the Bundesnetzagentur concluded that it would only be possible to certify an operator of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline if that operator was organized in a legal form under German law. The current firm is located in Switzerland. What does this development mean for the pipeline? Could it actually stop it or is it just a short delay? Well, it will be interesting. Uh, at least it surprised uh, a few people, I would say, because the... Um, uh, the reason why they have stopped, there were actually two reasons. First of all, because only companies after uh, or under full German law uh, can be registered. I mean, this is not new since <clears throat> Nord Stream, I think, is uh, registered in Switzerland for over seven years. So they came up after two months of uh, approving this. And the second thing is, of course, it must be completely unbundled. Uh, this is not uh, the case. And unbundling also means that... Um, 50% of the capacities of Nord Stream 2 must be um, set aside for rival producers, uh, opponent uh, uh, producers, gas uh, producers. And I don't think this was what Gazprom had in mind when they built this uh, pipeline. So that's a long way to go. First of all, we will see how long it will take for Gazprom uh, to implement uh, the first condition to set up a, a, a German um, or company or sub company um, and an independent uh, sub company for transport capacities uh, in Germany, then really to uh, show the complete um, um, unbundled uh, process. Um, then this <clears throat> can take another two months uh, for the German uh, regulator to decide and uh, to give an assessment. Then it will go to the European Commission. They will look at this much more critical. Uh, they will have four more months. And then <clears throat> it needs a final approvement uh, again by the German regulator, but also, and this is interesting, uh, by the new 
German Minister for Economy. And uh, Gigis, I really loved your statements. And maybe we we'll look into a new portfolio of a green Minister for Economy. Maybe it is a, a well-known friend in Ukraine. And maybe we also see a green Minister for Foreign Affairs. Who knows? And of course, this might change the entire uh, scene. But um, you all know that the SPD <laughs> still has the chancellor, that uh, even uh, Mr. Olaf Scholz was going to make a much more, um, was position himself uh, uh, much more critical than uh, all his colleagues from the same party. And uh, some of the history came back or of the past came back and uh, told him, yes, you should stay in line with what uh, Chancellor uh, Schröder and uh, Michael, uh, Matthias Platzek and, and many others um, ha have told him. But nevertheless, I think from the liberals and from the green side, we are pretty firm in, in, in trying to make sure uh, that we will use all opportunities, politically legal opportunities we have, not uh, to go for a quick fix as SPD and CDU uh, were going to to have that. Um, I also liked uh, your statement about the uh, German leadership in, in terms of uh, energy um, yeah, security. And this is a huge responsibility. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and we have seen it was misused by the former government, uh, not just once, but for a couple of, of years for the last uh, decade. Uh, I, I do regret that, and many people regret that. Um, one of the um, participants have asked about the COP. Of course, I mean, it does not fit into the European Green Deal, not at all. It will depend our uh, gas dependency from fossil fuels. Uh, we have enough pipelines. There's no questions about that. Uh, all the pipelines are working. Even uh, Gazprom uh, likes to spread around the news that the Ukrainians have not maintained their uh, the pipeline system uh, uh, well enough. And that's why they had to build this. But we all know this is just um, uh, a, fa a fairy tale, and uh, we have to counter uh, those uh, those fake news. But generally, I would say uh, there is not a big chance to, let's say, stop it completely. But there are very, very many opportunities to increase the cost, to postpone it, and to have, uh, let's say, quite a couple of bigger threats from our side, which hopefully we'll be used in terms of legal, but also on political side to make uh, the life much more difficult of the people in the Kremlin uh, than it was under the uh, big coalition and what we have seen before. And one more thing, maybe uh, what I forgot to say um, regarding the sanctions from the US. I mean, if there was one project where you have a partisan um, unity, uh, in the Congress, then it was definitely the the position on Nord Stream 2. And even this, uh, President Biden gave away, and I think this is extremely unfortunate. Okay, thank you. That actually, um, you'll tease up our last question for Ben. Um, the House of Representatives added an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act that would sanction Nord Stream 2 without the president having waiver authority. The administration is asking the Senate to replace that with an amendment that would only require the administration to issue reports on the gas situation in Europe. Will this administration ploy save Nord Stream 2 despite Kremlin gas games? And what should Congress do? Thanks, Ambassador Herbst. I, I think that, um, you know, everyone on this call has been following this issue for a long time. And, and just for context, this is the seventh year of this issue being, you know, the Nord Stream 2, quote unquote, debate going on. I think that we have to think of this in terms of how uh, this debate is often um, framed in the broader foreign policy community. And I, you know, I think that we've heard on these sort of events in the past, folks will say things like, sure, Nord Stream 2 is an issue, but we need to think bigger. Okay, we need to think about uh, global issues and other things like this. How, you know, how do we have, uh, you know, um, addressing, um, you know, a, a number of other, you know, larger issues like climate, like uh, China, like, uh, all, you know, a number of the other global challenges that we collectively face in the transatlantic community. The problem is, on both the strategic security side and on the climate side, you have a significant problem uh, if you don't end up stopping Nord Stream 2 in its tracks. And the reason is this. First of all, with Nord Stream 2, you have basically a 
Russian Malign Influence Project, where you have all of those uh, big headline grabbing concerns like we've had with a number of other um, you know, emerging technologies, infrastructure projects and investments from authoritarian nations making investments, um, uh, you know, quote unquote, economic deals in the West writ large. Um, and, and this goes for whether you're talking about uh, the Russian Federation with Nord Stream 2 or, uh, or, or China with Huawei and all of these sort of uh, debates. And it's funny that we, we treat all of these issues, whether it's energy or telecoms or, or cyber and all, all of these sort of, sort of national security concerns as, as individual issues that we should be debating. Um, and therefore, you know, we can, you know, trade away one for the other and, and, um, and then thereby somehow think bigger in terms of uh, global security. Well, the problem is this. All of those issues have the same thread, which is the challenge that we'll face over the next decade of how we respond in the West, in democratic societies, um, to those projects and those investments that directly undermine our resilience to authoritarianism. And so if we don't take action on things like Nord Stream 2 or Chinese telecoms and other security issues like that, um, there won't be this grand strategy uh, uh, opportunity in the future to actually take on that, you know, thinking bigger. And in terms of climate, not only do you have uh, the, the Amal Peninsula uh, in, in Russia having Gazprom infrastructure that the European Space Agency has shown directly has some of the most inefficient um, methane producing midstream infrastructure, pipelines, valves, et cetera, on the planet, but also the energy insecurity that is downstream of this, uh, that we're seeing right now, the weaponization of energy, makes it much harder for, uh, uh, you know, really, you know, forward leaning and, and what I like to call science diplomats uh, that, that I support at places like COP26 and elsewhere to actually make progress because you need to have this global buy-in. And if you have roving energy insecurity and national security issues that are directly related to energy, we won't be able to make this transition in the time that we need to to, to address the climate crisis. So this is, this is again, why this, this sort of issue, Nord Stream 2, is extremely central to what we're seeing in the national security space right now, meaning military aggression uh, and other weaponization of, uh, of hybrid threats, migrants and, and space, et cetera, in the European uh, region but also much broader global security issues, whether it's China or climate. And so you can't ignore these issues and not have them come back to your desk because that's what's going to happen. And so that's why Congress has an opportunity right now to do what it's, it's done in the previous uh, four consecutive years, if you count GATSA, uh, to come through and, and lead on this issue set once again. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're going to see a lot of debates over, over what exactly in terms of a sanctions package and, and how to balance that are, are, are proper. But the bottom line is this has been a bipartisan issue and, and, and should continue to be one because if it becomes a partisan issue, uh, we collectively, both in the United States and in the transatlantic community, are in a lot of trouble. Okay, Ben, thank you. We've already gone a little bit late. We need to get to audience questions. Um, I, I would just confirm that there is bipartisan opposition to Nord Stream 2, but at this point, there does not seem to be a willingness on the part of Democrats in the Senate to take strong steps, um, unlike what the Republicans did when Trump was playing games with aid to Ukraine. But that could change because this issue is just so vital importance to the United States. All right, we have a bunch of audience questions. Um, I have a question from, let's see, uh, Rosemary Thomas. Uh, can we hear how Ukraine's new role in the Nord Stream certification process in the EU will work and what opportunities it might provide Ukraine? I think that's for you, Mr. Vitrenko. Uh, it gives us a chance, first of all, to have an access to the file. So we will see the arguments uh, of the other side, uh, of the Russian side. It will also give us a chance uh, um, to explain uh, our arguments, so why Nord Stream 2 is not compliant with the EU uh, rules and uh, why it should not be uh, certified. Uh, but at the same time, uh, again, it's the right to be heard. So it does not mean that, that the uh, regulator, Benetza, Bundesnetz Agentur, uh, is obliged uh, to uh, take our arguments uh, uh, into consideration or again to somehow gives us a vote or something like that okay thank you uh we have a question relating to 
Let's see. Okay, from, um, forgive me if I mispronounce your name, from Jimmy Durgurl, the European Commission will have to issue an option opinion on the certification of Nord Stream 2 once it is notified by the German en en energy regulator. Do you think that Russia's recent provocations make it more likely that the commission would recommend against approval? Uh, Mr. Pavilionis, would you like to give a shot, take a shot at this? Well, if uh, if commission would think like like every Lithuanian think they would of course do it, but I think a lot will depend on new German coalition. If they signal uh, at least uh, you know willingness to that direction, uh, well, honestly, if when I feel what capitals uh, in other member states think, this is time to unite uh, because if we don't. Uh, if Nord Stream 2 is launched, uh, Russia might interpret it as carte blanche for Ukrainian occupation. And what then if that's starting to happen? Uh, so it's better to take uh, precautionary measures now to make it very clear that they cannot do it uh, yeah, on, on, on different levels and, uh, well, stop that uh, democracy, uh, you know, backlash, democracy decline that actually is a result of our own uh, inability to think strategically. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, let's see. We have an observation with, with a kind of a question from Ian Bond at the Center for European Reform in London. He, he says the following. It seems like there is tension between what uh, Mr. Pavilionis is saying, becoming energy independent from Russia, so you can't be blackmailed, and what Mr. Schmidt and Mr. Vitranko are saying to keep Russian glass, gas flowing via Ukrainian pipelines as an insurance policy against Russian aggression. However, he says, I can see the force of both ideas. In the long term, the, the former seems more promising in getting independence from Russia. But in the short term, Ukraine needs to deter a Russian attack in the coming months. So am I right to think that in the short term, the number one priority is to prevent Russia supplying Europe without needing Ukraine's pipelines? Ben, do you want to take a shot at that? Sure thing. I mean, yeah, I think in the long term, and I do mean long term, uh, that, that needs to be the goal. But I think you have to, again, remember what we're talking about here. It's often, often overlooked, and you know, I often kind of uh, tongue in cheek say that uh, this issue is often cast only in a quote unquote, Bloomberg terminal approach, meaning just a pure economic uh, uh, analysis. And the problem is we need to be looking increasingly at these issues when it relates to infrastructure from authoritarian nations from a multidisciplinary standpoint, not because the projects themselves have to be uh, uh, manifested in a multidisciplinary way, but because they de facto are, because uh, whether it's Moscow or Beijing, there is a, a clear mix of of uh, security issues, economic issues, uh, uh, strategic corruption issues, elite capture issues. Obviously, we've we've talked uh, uh, about uh, Gerhard Schroeder uh, in this discussion. Of course, he is famously uh, led to the term uh, the Schroederization uh, of Europe uh, uh, by working for Nord Stream One AG, now Nord Stream Two AG, Rosneft, etc. After approving Nord Stream One while in office, um, and we've seen a slew of officials uh, from. Austria uh, and, uh, and from France, most recently with Francois Fillon, taking jobs um, on Russian state-owned enterprises uh, following government service. Uh, of course, we see, you see uh, Austrian foreign, former foreign minister Karen Kneissel, who danced with Putin at her wedding uh, on the board of Rosneft now after supporting Nord Stream 2 well in office. So again, all of these sort of things are really concerning. And the, the thing that we have to decouple here is that the infrastructure dependence is different from the resource dependence. And so, um, Yes, right now, I think it has, there has to be this balancing uh, that takes place between, you know, having Russia reliant on infrastructure that it needs. Um, but then ultimately, we need to wean this off as quickly as we can over the next decade plus um, in terms of addressing climate change. But for right now, there is a national security contingency to, to stave off. Okay, thank hey, you. Man, yeah. um, Yuri, we're, we're, we're pretty much out of time. I got to do one more thing before. So if, if I can have your indulgence, uh, Mr. Groza wanted to make a point. Um, you, you've got 30, 45 seconds to make your point. 
Yeah, just to share with you one breaking news. Apparently, uh, Kremlin is resuming blackmailing Moldova. Uh, we just heard from Kuprianov, who is VP to uh, Miller, that they uh, um, declared that they will stop supplies of gas to Moldova as of tomorrow. Why? Because Moldova gas has not paid the debt uh, today. Today is the deadline for the debts that Moldova gas has to had to repay to Gazprom, uh, the debts which were accumulated for the last weeks, for the last month. And now, basically, what Gazprom is saying that they will cut uh, supplies of gas uh, to uh, to Moldova. Why? Because Moldova gas cannot pay. And what Gazprom wants, and Moldova gas wants, for the Moldova, for the government to take the responsibility, which means basically that. Uh, 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 Gazprom expects that uh, uh, has a contract directly with Moldovan citizens, uh, with uh, Moldova Gas not making any effort to find solutions how to pay the debt. Uh, and uh, now, as Gazprom, as the biggest, as largest shareholder of Moldova Gas, should actually bail out Moldova Gas and make sure that uh, uh, the supplies of gas are not interrupted. So I really call for action for our partners, EU, US, everyone. Uh, to immediately um, uh, interfere and uh, and uh, and make sure that uh, we are not coming back to the same talks, uh, difficult talks we had with Russia in the last uh, month. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Yuri. You have thirty seconds if you have something you want to add. But first, unmute yourself. Uh, okay. Very uh, briefly, I also believe that the European Union, the European Commission, should start thinking about ways how to uh, deal with uh, increased insecurity of Russian gas supplies. So, for example, there should be a requirement that uh, if you're importing from Russia, uh, you should have some strategic stock of gas uh, inside some storages uh, in the EU or European uh, neighbors, like, for example, Ukraine, energy community uh, countries. Or there should be a special uh, tax, for example, uh, to reflect uh, uh, the methane emissions uh, in the Russian system or something like that. But the point is that uh, the European Commission should really become serious about the threat uh, connected uh, with uh, these supplies. Okay, thank you for that. And I'd like to thank everyone for being with us for this very interesting conversation. We will continue to follow Nord Stream 2 and do future events. And I thank Mr. Groves, especially for that last minute uh, reminder of how Moscow continues to play gas games even when they seem to have reached an agreement with a potential partner. All the more reason for both Berlin and Washington to take a second look at Nord Stream 2. Thank you all very much.